Hey there gang, just working on this interesting mashup between a Jazzmaster and a Telecaster here. I've got uh, some shielding done in the cavities and I'm going to do some electronics work. The customer wants a four-way switch so he gets that series parallel effect and uh, he also wants the wiring reversed so the selectors at the back here rather than at the front. Just looking at that I realized by the time I put the new switch in there and flip these around and do the rewiring it's probably better if I just remove this entire harness and save that for another project. So I'll just redo this completely. Oh joy. You know there are a gazillion different ways of wiring a four-way setup in a Telecaster and over the years I've tried a number of them. Some of them work, some of them don't. Some of them work sometimes. Um, this one's a little bit tricky because we're trying to isolate the tone pot so it only functions on the bridge pickup. Um, you know, when you're playing a Telecaster, most often you're not trying to darken the neck pickup. And uh, when you switch over, it's nice to have it sort of in a preset location so you don't have to mess with the tone control. So that's what we're thinking of doing. you think that would be pretty easy. Um, but if you go and you look up online, you're not going to find very much information. And like so many sort of custom wiring designs, you end up on a message board from 2006 looking at a thread and some guys will say yeah that'll work no problem you know i seen it my my brother joshy his friend done it in the back of a pickup truck one time and it works great so you should do that and then of course you go and you try it and no brother joshy was wrong but eventually i found one that worked and uh, you want to see the stupidest thing i've done this week this is a four-way switch right and uh, so we got position number one click Position number two, click. Position number three, what? No click. Where are you, position number four? You're gone. It won't move over all the way into position number four. I'm looking at the little rollers here in the contacts, and it cannot be forced all the way into position four. It's not that there's a clearance problem with the switch plate or anything like that. I tried that, but no. It is a defective switch right out of the package. After doing all of this wiring and stuff, I've got to take it all off and redo it uh, after waiting for a new switch to arrive. So I guess I should probably add that to my list of things to do every time I'm doing electronics. You know, it's a simple thing. Like, if I was, you know, taking it out of another guitar, of course I'd test it, but it slipped my mind. And, um, yeah, I'm a doofus. This is a roasted maple neck from Warmoth, and it looks like they did a really good job. Feels great. Excellent finish. Actually, even smells good too. It smells like the sugar bush. I used to go and watch them harvest sap when I was a kid and boil it down for maple syrup and maple sugar. You got that interesting roasty, smoky flavor. Just fitting a bone nut in here and I want to address something while I'm at it. Um, for you guys who are making kit guitars or amateur repair, don't ever super glue in a Strat nut or a Telecaster nut because uh, it becomes a real nightmare for the repair guy later on. Taking them out without busting out this uh, very short length of end grain behind it is very difficult. You end up having to cut it with a saw and snap it out and file it out. It's a really long arduous procedure that is unnecessary if you fit it in there properly. You should be able to suspend it between thumb and forefinger without having it to fall out. Just make it snug, okay? So. What we're going to do to this thing, this is going to make some people cringe. We're going to put robot tuners on. No, I'm not joking. No. Uh, the player for this guitar, um, he uses an awful lot of alternate tunings. You know, he's constantly moving between open tunings during his set, and he finds that it actually, it's starting to hurt his fingers, his thumb. He's getting a pain, and he wants to see whether this can cut down on that for him while he's playing. So yeah, I'm going to put those on after I get that nut done. All right, I'm just getting the Tronicles in order here. The actual installation is not difficult at all. It's very easy, actually. On the back side, there is a plastic looking plate that sits flush against the headstock. The tuners get pushed down through holes, and they're not actually screwed in place. There are recesses molded into that plate that hold the tuners in position so they can't rotate. On the front side, there is a, uh, they're just held on with uh, standard washer and nut arrangement. Now here's the part where they kind of lose me. In order to string this, you have to loosen this finely threaded cap. And don't have that happen in a nightclub somewhere if it's dark. Roll that across the stage somehow. Uh, hold on to that some way. 
Um, they tell you to take that all the way off. I tried to do it without taking it off and it is actually really difficult. Um, next thing is we have to arrange the tuner shafts so that the recesses that are cut into it are at right angles to the string path. I'm doing that by hand. They tell you not to use a string winder for this. There is actually a function uh, programmed into it that will let you spin these freely, but in order to access it, you got to turn the thing over, press a certain button three times, then up and down, and work it back and forth until it's in the right spot. And I just, you know, I don't want to have to turn this thing over and back again 18 times while I'm stringing it, so I'm doing it by hand. Let's see if we can get you in a little closer here. So there's that little notch. Take the string, holding some tension on it, we go around it and up through that notch on one side. Maintaining that tension, we go back around. And to be honest, this isn't that easy on the heavier wound strings, like this guitar has a 52 for the low E. It was always slipping out of that little notch. Uh, for these higher strings, the B and E, they suggest going around the top twice. So I'll do that. Then we find that cap from wherever it rolled. Finger tight. They tell you never to use a screwdriver on this, they want you to use a penny. Of course, being in Canada, we haven't had pennies for about five years, so I had to go through my stash of American coins to find a one cent piece, and we'll tighten that down snug. So yeah, you know, um, if I have to take a tuner apart to get the string through it, I'm kind of suspect. Okay, I'm getting pretty fed up with this thing. I will say that doing a setup on a guitar with this in place is ridiculous. Uh, it's almost like you would want to put on a traditional set of tuners, get your correct nut and saddle heights and whatever, and then, you know, after that, switch it over to this thing. Um, I'm just trying to get the strings in tune. They're slack, right? And there's a function, did that randomly, that uh, for moving the string up and down, it says when the tronicle is turned off, so we've got it turned off. Press the on switch three times. Then press enter twice. The LED for the string to wind or unwind flashes red. I see no flashing lights. The left and right buttons select a string. The A flash there momentarily. Now it's the B. What's it doing that for? I don't know. Press and hold down to wind down. Press and hold up to wind up. Nothing. So this is a function which is really necessary, like if you're trying to get your... What's it doing? No idea. Oh, now it's doing it. Okay. We've got the bridge. Tone functions on that. You got the pickups together in parallel, which is the usual choice. It's hum canceling. Then you got series is a definite boost in output and uh, a little thicker tone and then you got neck alone and the tone doesn't function on the neck because we took that off And now for something completely different. Isn't that a little honey? This is a Washburn guitar made for Lion and Healy in 1895. I guess we can call it a parlor guitar. 
Although it really is kind of a grand concert guitar of its time, it's not for amateurs, I don't think. It's very nicely made. Dig that purfling. They don't make it like that anymore. The rosette's made of pieces of mother of pearl that have been sunk into a field of black mastic. And it's nice that it's complete because this stuff can get really dried out. It'll crack and oftentimes these will pop out and get lost along the way. Not easy to replace though. That's a lot of very fine cutting. So it's nice when they're all together like this. It's a classic American headstock shape. These nice little inlays here too. And the inlay continues up the fingerboard there. You've got stars, little clubs and diamonds, round things. That's a really nice detail here. The volute's been sort of carved into a lamb's tongue shape. Sexy. Nice dark Brazilian rosewood. The back's got a little bit of an open center seam here, but it's okay. It's got one crack, which is pretty typical for Brazilian of this era. They all seem to crack. Sides are in good shape. So the name of the game on this one is to get some better intonation going on here. This bridge has been removed from the guitar at some point. It's been pulled backwards slightly. Maybe that was done intentionally. And it also seems to me to have been shifted slightly towards what in this case is the bass side because this guitar is strung up as a left-hander. That could have been done to improve the string line. I don't know. Um, speaking of the fact that it's left-handed, what's interesting is many of the guitars in this period were um, made with little or no saddle slant, no compensation, um, just like a classical guitar, and which makes sense because these were strung with gut strings and were essentially classical guitars of the period. But um, in this case, the lower strings are playing quite a bit sour. He's um, stringing them with extremely light gauge uh, steel strings, composite strings, and um, you know, this guitar is kind of beefy inside. It's had quite a lot of repair work, so he feels safe in doing that. And uh, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to plug this. It's a good piece of ebony, so the plug will virtually disappear. And we're going to slant it slightly more towards the base. And we don't have a lot of room to do that. But he said, you know, do whatever you can. Get as much as you can out of it. Anything will be an improvement. So that's what I'm going to do. One thing before I take the saddle out here, I notice it seems to be leaning kind of towards the front here a bit. When I put my new saddle in, what I'm going to do is route it so the channel actually leans backwards a bit, and that'll gain us a, a few cents worth of intonation power. Mark the front side. Bottom of the channel here is kind of interesting. It looks like it's been scraped rather than uh, routed. And the ends, of course, are square, which is kind of a giveaway. Either someone went in there with a chisel and squared them up, or it was actually cut by hand using some kind of tool. You can see there was some evenness at the top of the slot here, which has left some gaps around the fill. So I'll put some glue on the top there, and then very lightly sand with some 220 grit sandpaper, creating a slurry of uh, ebony dust and glue, which will fill in those gaps. And that looks pretty good. It almost disappears entirely. Remember I mentioned the idea of an angled saddle slot? Well, I'm doing that by putting a couple of pieces of tape on the front edge of my router base plate here. That'll tip it back a couple of degrees relative to the top surface of the bridge and give us an angled slot. So there we have it. I think that looks pretty good. 
and the intonation is much better now on the bass strings. Still wish I had another millimeter or so, but can't get any closer than that. This is a left-handed guitar, of course, so I can't really play any masterpieces, but I'll try to get some sounds out of it.